Well, folks, we want to welcome you to the ministry of Upper Kings Clear Baptist Church. Again, we just want to take time uh, to begin with uh, just the Word of God, and then also from there go on to have a short word of prayer as we look into the message today. I just want to remind all of you that uh, come September 24th, 25th, we are going to start uh, special services here at the church. Uh, we are calling it a church renewal conference. And we would like for those who are able to come to be a part. It's going to start on a Sunday morning and it's go, going to go till Thursday uh, that week. Uh, if you have family and friends, we want you to invite them. Uh, we want to be a time that the church will be refreshed, strengthened, encouraged, uh, because there's a lot that's happening around the world and even around us, and the church must be strong. With that, I want to take a moment just to reflect on God's word. Today, my scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 1 to 13. So if you bear with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but not have love, I am noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burnt, but not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. May God add a blessing to his word. Uh, we just want to take a few moments of prayer. There are loved ones who are in the hospital even today. Um, some going surgery, undergoing surgery, some just uh, facing illness. Uh, and waiting for uh, for them to be called in to be dealt with their physical bodies and so there are just a lot of things that's happening and then also we know that the world is just uh, teeter-tottering uh, I mean it doesn't matter where you are um, I think we are still in one of the most stable parts of the world there is but the world is churning and we as believers want to just bring this before the Lord, that he may stabilize us. Would you pray with me at this time as we take a few moments of prayer? Father, again, we just want to come before your presence. Thank you for this beautiful day you've given to us. Thank you for life. Thank you for the greenery we see in this part of the world. Thank you for placing in one of the most beautiful parts of the world. And then, Father, thank you for your grace hovering over us around us, underneath us. Today we come in your presence, Father. We bring our loved ones. There are those who are even facing surgery today. There are those that were laid up with all kinds of illnesses. Those with uh, severe physical issues. There are those who are home because of illnesses at this time. We just want to bring them before your throne of grace and pray, Father, you would touch them, heal them, strengthen them so that there could be back with us. We also want to continue praying, especially those that are facing this dreadful disease of cancer. Father, there are numerous names, 
some of these folks, Lord, are young uh, mothers and wives. And Father, we just want to pray for your hand of mercy and grace to be upon them, that you in your time would bring healing, not only of the body, but of the mind and of the spirit. We also want to pray for our country, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful country that you have blessed us with. We are praying for our leaders, Lord. May we have men and women that know you, that love you, that will bring some sense and sensibility in our world. Thank you for your grace. We are also not forgetting for brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are going through this devastating time. We pray, Father, that you will hold the hand of evil men who will bring such destruction to lives of men and women, boys and girls and even children. We also want to pray, Lord, that we have come to the brink of as some have expressed the Third World War. Father, we pray for peace and we pray for your church. You've given us a message. We see the world is living in fear and in turmoil. And we've seen the devastation of this pandemic and a new pandemic on the rise. We we'll look to you and said, oh God, have mercy. You have promised to watch over your church, to protect your church. And Father, we thank you for that. We have many loved ones, Lord, that do not know you, friends and family, and we are praying even today that your word would reach their ears and their heart and their mind and you would draw them to yourself. Now, Father, as we look into your word, we pray you will speak to us. Let your truth ring out loud and clear. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are continuing our study in the book of Revelation, uh, the theme has been facing the end times. Now that doesn't mean that I'm saying that next week is going to be the end times. I do not know the day, the hour when Christ will call his church up. But I do know that the way things are churning all over the world. It's amazing that we haven't destroyed ourselves and we are very fast destroying ourselves in so many ways and forms facing the end times we went through chapter one of the book of revelation and we saw it begins with jesus christ his revelation and then we see that the topic moves quickly to his church the believers you and i and then in chapter 1, it outlines to us in detail now what's coming down the pike. But in the midst of that, the first people to be addressed are churches, are us. And that's what the Word of God will undertake first to address the churches to help us to be able to stand firm during this difficult, uh, confusing day. And if the church does not know where it stands and how it should stand, then the world will teeter totter even worse. And our message to a dying world will be destroyed. So here in all the wisdom of God, God begins first addressing his church. There are seven churches, as we see from um, Revelation chapter 2 going to chapter 3, there are seven churches that are going to be addressed directly. And each one will show the things they're doing right, the places where they are slacking, and in the areas where they are walked away from their maker and creator, our Lord Jesus Christ. As trying to bring these messages, I thought it was best to look at each church individually because the principles we can learn from these different churches that was addressed directly are really what is happening in our church today. We begin with the uh, Church of Ephesus. My message entitled, Visions of God's Grace to Ephesus. And you will see that each church are going to be 
talk to as individual churches. And each church are going to be scrutinized with what they are and what they are doing and what they are not doing. So we begin with the church of Ephesus. There's two main points and I'm going to break it down very quickly. I want to take the text and read the entire text, uh, verses 1, uh, 1 to 7, that is given to us. To the church in Ephesus, please bear with me as I read Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. I'm just going to read the text through before we break it down and try to understand what God is saying to us at this Upper Kinclair Baptist Church. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. How you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently, bearing up for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. There we find the first church is being addressed very directly. The church of Ephesus. We want to look at the church of Ephesus, Ephesus the standing church. As you read from the text, it is a church that was doing a lot of things right. Ephesus the standing church. First we want to view this church in three different terms. The church viewed practically. And then we want to view the church viewed perennially. And then thirdly, the church viewed prophetically. First, the church viewed practically. The formal church. Where was it located? It was located in the chief port of Asia Minor. Means there was a lot of trades happening in the city of Ephesus. It was a business center, but it was also a spiritual center. But there's something very interesting about this uh, place, Ephesus. You see, there was a harbor in Ephesus, but there was something very interesting taking place in Ephesus at the harbor. There was continuing silting. That means silt was being was coming and filling in the harbor. So what was water once was now land, and what was land was now water. The continual silting. The shifting character of the city is reflected in the Lord's words to the Ephesian assembly. Once strong in its love for him, Ephesus is seen to him as a sifting as shifting away. What's the danger? You're saying, Pastor, I thought you're going to talk about the end times. Yes, we are talking about the end times. But first, Christ starts with this church. And it's so important for us to understand that as a church, we have a vital role before God shuts this world down. The church has a vital role. So it begins with this church. The church is viewed practically. The church is viewed perennially. The condition existing in these seven churches 
a reflection of our churches. And if you go from church to church, even in our province of New Brunswick, you will find some of the symptoms that happened in Ephesus is very, it's evident uh, in our churches. The question I have for you and for myself this morning, is this evident in our church at Upper Kings Clear? You see, the condition existing in these seven churches are a reflection of our churches. Ephesus sets before us the issue of fundamentalism. The picture is that of a church busy and outwardly sound, but notably lacking love, especially love for Christ. How can that be, you ask? How can that be? And then the church viewed prophetically. You see, the churches may seem to be representing different periods of church life, but I don't think so. I think the seven churches were chosen by Christ so that because each church was acting and behaving and he wanted to pin, uh, pinpoint out very clearly where they were acting and living right and where they were missing the point. See, the churches may be seen, like I said, representing different periods of church life, but it seems that the church fell asleep. Think about the picture of you are in a little rowboat. Beautiful day, nice, warm, and you just go for an easy ride in, the, in your boat. And almost you fall asleep. And when you come to it, you find you have drifted in the weeds. You have drifted in the weeds. You see, it seems that the church fell asleep at the oars and began to drift. And it can and does happen slowly that we find ourselves in the weeds. And this has been an experience in my own heart as I've looked at churches all around us. And the question that stands in my mind, are we asleep at the oars, people? Are we drifting into the weeds? And the sad part is not even know it that we are drifting in the weeds. That's the church viewed prophetically. First we see Ephesus the standing church. We read from the text the good things that were said about this church. But now look, let's look at Ephesus, the fallen church. Do you realize that the church in Ephesus was the only church to receive two letters? One from the Apostle Paul and one Paul addressed the Ephesians. Very interesting, Paul will have two prayers, specific prayers for this church. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. First, his prayer will be that they would have more light. Now, you know what more light means. More of Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. Paul would pray that their eyes would be opened up and the light of life, the light of Jesus Christ, would shine so brightly on them and then in them. Secondly, that they would have more love. That they would have more love. Now why would Paul want to pray for such a powerful church in that way? You see, the word of God is so consistent. In the book of Revelation, the first church to be dealt with and the first church to be pinpointed having the lack of love for the Lord, doing everything right, but lacking in love. Paul had addressed his letter to the church in Ephesus. Let's move along and see, first, the faithful works of this church. What, what was this church doing right? What was this church doing right? First, we see the faithful works of this church. Listen, as I read the text again, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, 
the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and have not grown weary. It was a church that was standing up to the task. The Ephesus church was a busy church doing a lot of spiritual things. I mean, program for children, for youth, for adults, for women, for men. Many spiritual conferences, great Sunday school, Bible teaching. They were a busy church full of spiritual activities. They had works, labors, and patience. So what's the problem? Isn't that what the church called to do? And weren't they doing it? Well, let's go back to the text. First, the word, the words of him, verse 1, who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Can a church be so busy when the Lord and the Master has walked away from it and still seem to be on the right track? Because here you see the word is very clear. Verse 2, I know your works. Verse 3, I know you're enduring patiently. You see, it was standing up to the task. But he seemed to have lost the faith and the hope and the love. It was standing up for the truth. They repudiated evil, moral evil. They wouldn't stand for it. They held to a strict biblical standard. They repudiated anybody who called themselves a minister. You had to prove your apostle, the one being sent out. You had to prove if you want to speak in the church at Ephesus. They just didn't take anybody off the street to give them something that would tickle their ears. They were amazing in that sense. You had to prove your apostleship before you were accepted. They were vigilant. They stood against false doctrine. That means they were so vigilant for the truth. And he said, but isn't that such a commendable thing for the church in Ephesus? Yes, it was. Christ who walks among the golden lampstands, which is his church, he notices everything. It was not only standing up for the ta to the task, it was standing up for the truth, it was standing up in the test. They stood against opposition and did not buckle under pressure. You see, it seems they were very faithful people, but they were not very fruitful. Ephesus, the fallen church. A, the faithful works of this church. It was standing up to the task. Verses 1 and 2a. It was standing up for the truth. Verses 2, verses 1 to 2b. Thirdly, it was standing up in the test. They stood against the opposition and did not buckle under pressure. He says, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, means they were about the business seriously. Now you need to understand, Ephesus was a commercial center. The ships that were coming to its harbor were bringing all kind of stuff. It was a place where there was great idolatry, there were gods and goddesses, great statues set up in Ephesus. 
for a church to survive in that kind of environment was dangerous. It took guts. It took uh, just the gumption. But you know what? We see the faithful works of this church. But there is a problem. Who does the evaluation of the problem, people? That's what I want us to consider very briefly. Then in chapter 1 he says, When John turned around, he saw one like the Son of Man walking among the golden lampstands. The golden lampstands are representative of his church. We, who call ourselves the Church of Jesus Christ, are his representative this side of eternity. And it's as if Christ is walking among us every time we gather here on Sunday. But that's what the picture that's given to us. So what was the faith, the fatal weakness of this church? Well, look with me, verses 2 to verse 5, the first part of verse 5, eh? You see, when Paul wrote to Ephesus, he reminded the believers of their position in Christ. The letter of the Ephesians is such an amazing, amazing work that was given by the Holy Spirit to Paul. And Paul nails it correctly because it didn't come from his own mind. It came from God himself. Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus their position in Christ. He writes, you are reason. He said, quicken together with Christ, raised with Christ, seated in the heavenlies in Christ. That was the position of believers in this Ephesian church. And Paul has to remind them of that. Because in the midst of persecution and pressure, we forget who we are and where we are. And Paul makes it so clear to this church. But we read in Revelation chapter 2 verse 4. This is Christ speaking through Apostle John. He writes, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Wow! Amidst all the busyness, spiritual activities from wall to wall in that church, there was one very important ingredient that is lost. Many of us get excited about talking about the, uh, the end days. What's going to happen? It's intriguing. It's mysterious. It is great. But I said, you know, before you talk about the end days, the end times, let's come and see our own hearts before the Lord. Here it is Christ who is giving this evaluation, not John. He says, but I have this against you, verse 4. You have abandoned the love you had at first. And then he gives this warning. Remember, therefore. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. And then, not only remember from where you have fallen. The second word is repent. Turn around. And do not do the works and do the works you did at first. Means what were they doing first? And then comes the warning. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What was happening? Why such harsh words to such a hard working group of people? They were enduring. They were toiling. They had patient endurance. They were bearing up for Christ's name. 
many activities constantly. But what was the problem? First, the vitality of their passion was gone. You know, it seems if the place where you can be so busy, so occupied is the church. Why are we so busy in our religious duties? Let me just say, if service for God is not born out of a devoted passion for the Lord Jesus, it is worthless. We become so tuned to so much activities in the church. And like the Ephesian church, we may be doing all the right things the right way. But what about the vitality of our passion. That was the problem with the Ephesian church. The vitality of their passion was gone. Now they got involved in doing and getting involved in the activities. But the objective that should have been their love for the Lord, which is the true energy for service, had gone out through the back door. And the sad part is, they didn't seem even to recognize that's what had happened. Until the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Savior, the Redeemer, stands in the middle of his church, standing among the golden lampstands, and says, hey, how are you reflecting? me to a dying world and that's what church's number one task is to reflect the lord jesus christ to a dying world for you to reflect the lord jesus christ to your family to your friends to those in your circle and yet what happens we carry more bondages in our life and the world looks at us and says, really? You who's preaching that you'll be going to heaven? But what's the problem? The vitality of their passion was gone. Not only that, the validity of their profession was gone too. The validity of their profession was gone. You know, because a church has many activities does not mean it is on the right spiritual track. If our service to Jesus Christ does not come from our love for Him, then we are serving ourselves and we are busy with activities but not serving Him. You see, this is what happened in Ephesus. The enemy made off with gold of devotion. Yes, the enemy robbed them the gold of their devotion. And guess what? The church settled with brass instead. Let me give an example. Rehoboam, one of the kings of Israel, when he was reigning, Egypt came and they kind of came and took the golden shields that was put there by Solomon the golden shields in the temple of God. Egypt took them. So what was Rehoboam to do? Instead of crying to God and saying, God, give us strength to bring those shields back, because those shields meant something. He just said, ah, let's make them of brass. Put enough brass on this brass shields. And when you put it towards the sun, it's going to shine. Nobody will know the difference. So from gold shields, they were satisfied with the brass seals. Yes, brass will shine in the sun. 
it gave, it gave an illusion that the shields were there, but it was just an illusion because they were not gold shields. You've heard the words that said sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. That's what Paul began in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Sounding brass and tinkling cymbal is the way that Paul described the Christian duty devoid of love. And this is why I read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you can go back to that passage and read it for yourself. Not only the vitality of their passion was gone, the validity of their profession was gone. And then thirdly, the forceful warning to this church. Revelation chapter 5, the second part of verse 5. If not, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. First, love must be absolutely paramount. No love, no light is the rule. If Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, and our hearts do not respond in love for him, then we will have a great religion that is sitting in darkness. The consequences are devastating. Christless church, extinguished, just a shadow. You can go to England today. The big churches have been turned into mosques, into Hindu temples. The big churches have been turned into business enterprises. What happened? with all its pomp and formality, the love for Christ seems to have dwindled. It's happening in our part of the world too. You can go to America now and many churches have become mosques and Hindu temples and other spiritual entities. There are more churches closing its doors it's happened here in New Brunswick, our little province. What has happened? I think the disease that was in the church in Ephesus, I think is the same disease that has got hold of our, our churches. The question I have is not looking out and saying, oh, look at that church, look at that church. The question I have for you and for me, are we like the Ephesian church? Because when the love for the Lord is there, it's not a static thing, it's a moving thing. It's powerful. And you know why I say it's powerful? Because when people walk into the church, my love for the Lord will be so evident because it is so powerful. It reaches out and touches the broken hearts and souls that God will send our way. Love must be absolutely paramount. And then love must be absolutely positive. Look at verse 6. Yet this I have. You hate the work of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You see, this church, the Ephesus church, was doing all the right things. And any time they heard a group or people that were perverting the word of God, oh, they stood against it. They did not put up with any foolishness, any shenanigans when it came to the word of God and practicing the word of God, but they forgot to love the Lord of the word. And I'll tell you, it is so subtle. And it can happen when people will come to the church business meeting and will be more adamant to get their way. 
what they want accomplished. But you get a people who love the Lord first. The attitude is always, how can we lift Christ higher? That's the difference between being so religiously tuned up. On the other hand, having the love for the Lord that surpasses your preferences, your likes, your dislikes. And every service is meted out because of your love for the Lord. You see, the power of love for the Lord must surpass the hate for false works, the spiritual fervor. Jesus said, yet I have this. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Oh yeah, they hated the things that God hated. But that did not prove their love. Thirdly, love must be personal. Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let me just bring this to a close by saying this. Do you know it's hard work to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? It's not easy. We are in the flesh. The flesh has its own demands, its likes, its dislikes. The flesh is always warring against the Spirit of God in us. So the battle comes right in the middle of the person in our heart. It's not easy in this selfish world to love anybody outside of ourselves. This is why marriages are in so much trouble. The beautiful young lady wants to be loved because she loves herself. The young man wants to be loved because he loves himself. And sooner or later you find that which two must become one are beginning to pull apart. Each one carrying their own bag because it's empty. That also can happen to you and I in this church today. You see, if you're going to be facing the end times, shouldn't we have the right standing with our Lord and Master? It begins with our love for Him. Love must be absolutely personal. He who is in here, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. Because it's a battle. It's not just something you can just put on today and say, oh, look, you know, I've just put on my love clothes for the Lord. It doesn't work that way. That means you have to undress your heart. And I have to undress my heart and redress my heart with the love for the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see, sometimes one individual response is needed to motivate others. Just like the first responders in the medical world. I love it, you know, whenever there is a catastrophe, you know, the fire, the ambulance, the medics are called. And there's always the one who's always sitting ready and they jump in their machine and they are there in a matter of minutes. They're called the first responders. Today the Church of Jesus Christ needs first responders. The question is, can you be counted on to be the first responder? Would the Church of Jesus Christ, this Church of Upper Kings Clear, be a first responder? Or are we going to wait and see who else will stand?
Isn't that, you know, they say misery loves company. So when somebody else stands up, they say, ah, now I'll stand up. Can I say to you, why not stand if you're the only person? Why not stand if you're the only person? If we are going to face the end times, let's have a right standing on the right platform. Let's get our feet so sunk in the truth. But we can be busy sinking our feet in the truth and miss out loving our Lord with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, without love. As Paul will write in 1 Corinthians, you are nothing. No matter what we can accomplish, no matter what we can do. The church of Ephesus was doing everything right. But they missed out in one point. And when Jesus says, if not, I will come and take your lampstand out. Where is the church in Ephesus today? Many churches just faded away. And you can go back and you can do your research and you will put your finger that the warning that Jesus gave to the church of Ephesus is what has happened to many good churches. God is not interested in good churches because we are called the bride of Christ. There must be love. A marriage without love, you know it's not a marriage. It's just an arrangement for time and for a moment. You see, the correct church does not mean just a holy church. Good, wholesome programs does not mean a healthy church. But the church that loves Christ passionately is the church that displays God's glory to the dying world. The church that loves the Lord passionately is the church that displays God's glory to the dying world. What's my fear? How far is God from removing his lampstand among us, Upper Kings Clear Baptist Church? If you are facing the end times, then let's get back in the right standing with our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. Thank you for your words. Thank you for the church in Ephesus, for the right things they were willing to do. But also we see that you pinpointed where they had turned away. Father, if we at Upper Kings Clear are suffering in the same place, your word is given to us. Yes, we can make a correction. Show us how and help us to obey. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.